am the whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Tonight, it's the whistler's strange story, a present for Ricky. Subscribe. The spotlight subtly changed from white to a delicate blue, and the small nightclub orchestra slid into three-quarter time as the dance team began their waltz. The Croydons, Clyde and Marie, had held top billing at the club for almost a year, and it was well-deserved. Drinks stood unnoticed on the table. Conversation stopped. Everyone now was watching the Croydon, or rather, Marie Croydon. Slim, graceful, blue velvet Marie, smiling as she spun across the floor, poised for a moment, and floated effortlessly back to Clyde's waiting arms. The customers loved it, thought that there was a first-time look about it, even in the way they murmured to each other as they swayed gently together in three-quarter time. You're on your toes tonight, Angel. You? Why don't you tie your arm for a change? Take it easy. If I have to prop you up on another turn, I'll spring. Yes, the customers loved it. Clyde and Marie, husband and wife. Quiet maturity and breathless youth. And at the same time, on the other side of the room, a theatrical agent named Stanley Craig appraised the Croydons a little more critically. You like her, eh, Stan? Girl's good. She just needs a younger partner. The old boy slows her up. You see what I mean? Look at that spin. That's just too old for her. He's killing the act. You wouldn't be fixing to cut him off at the ankles, would you? What do you mean? He just might be promoting the lumber expert you just picked up as a new partner. Name's uh, Ricky, isn't he? What if I am? He's the boy who can do it. He's young, Mike. He's got looks and youth. You see what I mean? All right, Marie. Let's get it over with. Get what over with? Your nightly speech. That crack you made out on the floor. How? Oh, that? Uh... Yes, that. You like my hair this way, Clyde? I'm waiting, Marie. Oh, forget it. I don't want to go through it all again now. I think it's time we had it out. Listen, Clyde. Why are you trying to kid yourself? You know it can't go on like this. I don't know. You just got a pretty good hand. You mean I got a good hand? You might as well admit it. I don't think that's quite fair. Well, it's true, Clyde. I'm getting tired of propping you up, covering up your fumbles. Tying my hair in my mouth every time we go into a Now, stand. wait a minute, You please. wait a minute. Maybe you're right. Maybe we better have it out right now. When I picked you up, you were nothing. Jitterbug champion of West Washington Heights. Why, in five years... Don't I've... give me that loyalty, pitch. I've heard it before. If you really want to talk about loyalty, let's talk about your first wife. You forgot about her in a hurry, didn't you? Sure, she was too old, throwing up the ass. Didn't matter to you then, did it? No. Sorry, baby. i got to get rid of you. I know it's tough, but it's show business. Off you go to Reno. What makes you think I'm old? You're 40. And that's too old for me. And incidentally, it's not just my opinion. They're talking about it in the case. Who's talking about it? People who ought to know. They're telling each other I'd be on top. I had a partner whose bones didn't creak. You got somebody in mind? I might have. Well, forget it. I have no intention of letting you go. Either as a partner or as a wife. You're smart. Without me, you wouldn't rate bottom billing at a third-rate burlesque in Jersey City. That has nothing to do with it. All right, give me a better reason. Over there, on the table. The roses? The roses. This the reason, Marie? These roses, night after night? The same card, Ricky. 
Who is Ricky? One of the customers who likes my dance. Is that all? So far? I think you're in love with him. That's what's behind all of this stuff about my dancing, isn't it? You love this guy, and, and my dancing is as good an excuse as any to... Who is he, Marie? Ricky. The name is Ricky. What's his last name? It's none of your business at the moment. I think it is. He's a dancer, isn't he? Yes, Inspector. He's a dancer. You might as well end the third degree right here. You're planning to team up with him, aren't you? You won't get away with it, aren't you? I won't let you. My career doesn't mean anything to you, does it? Only when it affects mine. That's why you married me, isn't it? For the effect I have on your career. You married me for the same reason. Well, maybe I did, but the reason is gone now. I don't need you anymore, Clyde. I need Ricky. Hmm. Now you know. Let's handle the whole thing reasonably, shall we? We wind up here in another week. I'll finish up with you... Then you can... Then I can find myself another partner. Now oh, that it takes too long, I can't start all over again now. I guess I'll have to start at the other end with Ricky. I'll look him up tomorrow. You don't even know who he is. I have a pretty good idea who his agent is. That ought to get me somewhere. Stanley Craig, isn't it, Marie? How did you know? Stanley Craig, theatrical agent. You shouldn't have left his card on your desk yesterday, darling. Why? Why did you do anything to Ricky? You do love him, don't you? All right, I love him. For the last time, what's it going to be, Ricky or me? I've already told you. Nothing can change it, Carl. This is our last week. All right. That's all I wanted to know. In just 30 seconds, The Whistler will continue tonight's story. Don't be half right. Use Yousafi. For example, would you say that the use of calendars goes back 1,200 years? No, that's only half right. Brush up on your ancient history. Tell your I and E officer you want to study with the United States Armed Forces Institute, USAFI. It's easy. It's simple. If you don't want to be half right, use USAFI. And now, back to The Whistler. is made up, and you know Marie well enough to realize that nothing you can do or say will change it now. And everything she said was true. Without her, you're nothing. There'll be no more top billings at a thousand a week in expensive night spots. No more polite applause from the cafe society crowd. No more penthouse apartments. Nothing but a seat on the sidelines while Marie and Ricky drift across ballroom floors, on and up to the top. It's early the next morning when you leave your apartment by the private elevator. And 20 minutes later, you walk up a flight of creaky stairs to Stanley Craig's office in the West 40. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? You're Stanley Craig? That's me. Pull up a chair. Thank you. I thought I might be a little early. Yeah, I didn't recognize you. From, uh, you're Clyde Croydon. I saw your act again last night. Really? Yeah, good act, too. Thank you. What can I do for you? Answer a few questions. Sure, glad to. You manage a dancer named Ricky? I see what you're getting on. Yeah, I manage him. New boy specialist in rumbas and tangos. Very fine dancer. That's what Marie tells me. They'd make a great team, Mr. Craig. Ricky, Marie. She's not at liberty, Mr. Craig. She's my partner. And my wife. I must admit this sort of thing going behind my back. I... But I'm sure she resents it, too. That's not what Ricky told me. Look, Mr. Croydon, 
You've been in the game long enough to know what youth means in a dance game. I don't think you're being very fair to me. If she goes for it, I guess Ricky will be a new partner. There's just nothing you can do. I would like to talk to him, if you don't mind. Sure. Just say when. Today. Where is he now? Out in the park somewhere. He walks for two hours every morning. Good for the legs, you know. Alone? <laughs> be hard to find another guy who would knock off eight miles in the park before lunch, don't you think? Yeah, he's alone. Well, does he come here after his walk? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Might be a couple hours. I have all morning. Okay. The new variety's on the desk. You'll be alone here. No one to bother. Thanks. Uh, take it easy, huh? Sure. Uh, Mr. Croydon. Yes? No hard feelings? Right. No hard feelings. No, Clyde, no hard feelings at all. Just the amazing realization that not one minute ago, as you talked to Stanley Craig, you calmly, unemotionally, coldly decided to murder your wife, Marie. There was no shock to it at all. <laughs> it if it had been there all the time in the back of your mind, waiting to be formulated into thought. Yes, Clark. You are in Stan and Craig's office alone. Ricky is walking in the... Marie is at home alone. You realize an identity like this might not happen in a thousand years. <laughs> if you're going to do it at all, Clark, you've got to do it now. On the top of the file cabinet, you find a package of Stanley Craig's letterhead. On his desk, a battered typewriter. In your pocket, the card signed Ricky that came with the flowers. And most important, in your mind, an idea. Marie, my darling, it is useless to try to put this into words. I've told no one of your decision to stay with Clyde because I know it isn't final, that you love me and always will that the only future for either of us is together. You finish the note, and at the bottom of it, after all my love, you carefully copy Ricky's signature from the card. On the desk is a sharp letter opener with Stanley Craig's name on it. That's part of it, too, Clark. You put it in your coat pocket, ready when you need it. Now, back to your apartment. You still have over an hour. And you know Marie will be alone. Hello, Marie. Oh. Where have you been? You know where I went. Did you see him? Ricky. Who else? He wasn't there. Seems he was taking his morning walk in the park. Remember when we... Used to walk in the park together, Marie. You're breaking my heart. Uh, I want to show you a letter. Huh? Yes, read it. Oh. It's addressed to you. Marie, my darling, it's useless to try to put this into words. I've told no one of your decision to stay with Clyde because I know it isn't final. That you love me and always would... Oh, Clyde, Go on, Marie. Read the rest of it. Hmm? Let me see. Always will. That the only future for either of us is together. You must believe me, darling. I'd rather die than have it any other way. I'm coming to your apartment tomorrow morning at 11. We must decide this once and for all. All my love, Ricky. <laughs> What's the matter, Marie? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Clyde, that's the funniest thing I've ever read in my life. What are you doing? It's a present for Ricky, <laughs> darling. I'm afraid I don't... What are you doing with that letter opener? He's going to the chair, Marie, for your murder. Don't <laughs> 
cry, please. Please. No cry. No. No. Mr. Croydon. Yes, still around. I'm beginning to wonder if Ricky will show up at all. Anybody call? Mm, not unless they called while I was out stretching my legs, walked around the block a couple of times. Sorry you had to wait so long. Oh, that's all right. It gave me a chance to think things over. Is that uh, good or bad? You think it's good? I decided it's wrong for me to try to stand in her way. If this looks like a break for her and Ricky, I think they deserve a chance. I was hoping you'd see it that way. Thanks a lot. Well, I'd better be going. Tell Ricky about that when he comes, will you? Sure. Are you going home? Yes, I think I'd better tell Marie. Headquarters. This is Clyde Croydon. I live in the penthouse at 1232 Warwick Place. 1232, that's right. Please send somebody up here as quickly as you can. My wife has been murdered. Feel better, Mr. Croydon? I think so, Sergeant. Ah, it's quite a letter we found in the wastebasket. What do you think of it? I didn't know what to think. You knew what was going on between this man and your wife? There was nothing going on. It was all in his mind. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, look, I've never seen this, this Ricky. I don't know who he is. All I know is that he started sending Marie flowers after every performance. He had some crazy idea she was in love with him. It was ridiculous. She hardly knew him. And what about the dance business? That was part of it, too. He thought she'd leave me and team up with him. Don't ask me why. But she laughed at him. Well, that's as good a motive as I've seen in 20 years. You know, it's a wonder he didn't leave a confession note right on the table. He left everything else. First class motive, letter in the wastebasket, the knife with his manager's name on it and the bushes outside. And yet... What? With all that... After practically shouting from the housetops that he'd killed her, he carefully wipes his prints off the knife. <laughs> Funny how a murderer's mind works, isn't it? Yes. It's hard to understand. Well, by the way, Mr. Croydon, now this is only a formality, of course, but where were you yesterday morning? In Craig's office, waiting for Ricky to show up. Craig seemed to think she'd go for him as a new partner, and I finally decided to go down and settle it. Have any words? No, I just told him if it was all right with Marie, it was all right with me. I knew, of course, how she felt about him. Where was Ricky at the time? Walking in the park, exercising his leg. Alone? I guess so. There it is again. I bet the guy hasn't even got himself an alibi. Have you talked to him yet? Well, the boys are looking him up now. If you ask me, Mr. Croydon, that guy's a dead pigeon. All of us are proud of our hometowns, and rightly so. In this brief moment before we continue with our program, we'd like to offer a salute to one of our hometowns in America, Cleveland, Ohio. The seventh largest city in the United States. Cleveland was founded in 1796 by General Moses Cleveland, chief surveyor for a land company. His employers bought three million acres in what is now northern Ohio, paying 40 cents an acre. Just by way of comparison, an acre in downtown Cleveland today would bring some two million dollars. It is an important Great Lakes shipping point and the site of iron and steel manufacturing. Other Cleveland products include paints, varnishes, electrical appliances, chemicals, and automobile and airplane parts. 
It is well known for its cultural developments also. The city owns and operates its own dramatic theater. And the Cleveland Symphony Orchestra is widely acclaimed. In the Cleveland Cultural Gardens, a mile-long strip of park area, more than 30 nationality groups represented in Cleveland's population are creating gardens as memorials to peace. 120 years is a short time in the world's history, but during that time, Cleveland has taken its honored place in the building of America. And now, back to The Whistlers. was a little nerve. You're over the hump now, all ready to act as number one witness for the prosecution in the case against Ricky. Tomorrow, the story will break in the paper, and the notoriety, the public sympathy over your bereavement should make it easy to pick up a new partner, one who'll keep you in the top spot, in penthouse apartments with private elevators. Yes, Clive, you can relax now. You've decided it's all over. Sergeant. I'm sorry to disturb you, Mr. Croydon. Uh, I was about to go to bed. Anything wrong? We've got Ricky. Oh, good. Yeah, I just finished questioning him. Mind if I come in? Not at all. Uh, we uh, checked the note against Craig's typewriter. That's where it came from, all right. And then it looks like you've got a case. The note threw us a curve for a while. What do you mean, for a while? Until we found Ricky. He claims he didn't write it. Good Lord, what did you expect him to say? Just a minute. I'll show you what I mean. Come on in, will you? Mr. Croydon? This is Ricardo Montez, also known as Ricky. He did it. He killed my wife. He wrote the note. No sé de qué hablan, señores. Pero no la maté. Wait a minute. That's what I mean about the note, Croydon. The boy doesn't know a word of English. It's a fake, is he? Ah, we checked that, too. But there was another thing about that note that really tied it up, Croydon. If he could have written it, he'd have signed it in his own handwriting. But it was his handwriting. Uh, it was his name. But the florist's handwriting. in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as The Whistler, Vic Perrin, Gene Bates, Harry Bartell, and Jack Moyle. The Whistler, directed by Gordon T. Hughes. The music by Wilbur Hatch is produced by Joel Malone and transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarities of names or resemblances to persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Dan Coverly speaking... And reminding you to listen again next week for another strange tale by The Whistler. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.